Hey, this is Neil coming to you from the Big Island of Hawaii and here to introduce Dave Ackerman, who's uh, out of the Gateway Division, uh, I think in St. Louis, Missouri. He's been a HO, DCC freelance builder of his railroad, but is a former retired computer scientist, not former retired, I guess you're just a retired computer scientist. And unlike uh, a lot of us, or I guess like a lot of us, you have a lot of similar interests to the rest of us. You have children, you enjoy woodworking, you're a classically trained baritone singer, and I can't wait to hear this presentation. Thanks, Dave. Welcome. Well, thank you. And thank you for everybody who's listening in today. Uh, this uh, presentation will be a little bit different because it is pre-recorded. And at the end, we will open it up for, uh, for questions and answers. So we've got about 46 minutes of video here about how I got involved with uh, uh, 3D uh, printing. And I look forward to sharing my initial experiences uh, with everyone. So could we roll tape? Welcome to this clinic on what you can do with a 3D printer in model railroading. So what are we going to cover today? How about things like how I came to decide that I would invest in my own 3D printer? What it is going to cost? The most important factor in buying a 3D printer? Where to go for designs you can print? Things I learned about how to keep my printer and myself happy? And some design secrets for things I created myself? Before we go too far, here is my 3D printer, an Ender 3 Pro, which I bought from Micro Center in July 2020. And here are some of the objects I have printed successfully. Some I obtained from libraries and some I designed myself. And here are some of the objects that were not so successful. 3D printing can be frustrating. You can take as many notes as you like, but be advised there is a handout with what I consider to be the main points at my website at http colon slash slash d a a c k m dot g i t h u b dot i o information on other clinics I have taught can be found there as well but today I would like to share my observation that using a 3D printer is kind of like stages of love. There are several stages. Curiosity, commitment, learning to love, raising a family, sharing secrets, and mastery of relationships. Like love, it will be expensive, complex, but can be highly rewarding if you are willing to invest and learn. I know you are already curious about 3D printing and model railroading because here you are watching a webinar on the topic. You've probably watched several other YouTube videos as well. Maybe browsed Amazon for printers or have some magazine articles hidden away. It's time you have a conversation with Uncle Dave about the facts of life of 3D printing and model railroading. So sit down and listen. If you think that 3D printing is as simple as it appears in videos and magazines, you are mistaken and will be frustrated. If you think 3D printing is quick, you are as mistaken as trying to time paint drying with a stopwatch. If you think that 3D printing will save you money, you are mistaken and will waste money. But if you think 3D printing will make your railroad more fascinating and unique, and are willing to invest and grow with it, maybe you and 3D printing might have a future together. Like DCC, 3D printing is a sub-hobby all by itself, and I have a poem for you. DCC is frustrating, 3D printing is too. If you can't handle one, you can't handle two. So, how does 3D printing work? To make something with a 3D printer, you need to have a model and either use a service bureau or have slicer software and access to a 3D printer. A model is a collection of three-dimensional objects, such as cubes and cylinders, which together represent a shape you wish to create. 
Models can be created in computer-aided design software, and entry-level CAD software is often free. Or models can be downloaded from massive online libraries of models. Models often exist in the STL file format for stereolithography. Service bureaus are companies who have internet sites where you upload your STL models and they will print them for you for a somewhat reasonable fee and a large elapsed time. Otherwise, if you have access to a 3D printer, you can feed your models into a slicer, which will convert your model into a multitude of instructions for where to deposit a series of layers of filament with your printer. These instructions are called G-code. If all goes well, after 10 minutes to 24 hours, you may have created a trash can or the parts to construct an HO building. For my first project, I decided I wanted to create walls and floors for a three-story building into which I would add LEDs for random lighting. I downloaded Tinkercad design software measured the internal dimensions of my Woodland Scenics building, and in about five hours I had learned enough to have a model I liked. I also learned that building size models can take between 6 to 24 hours to print, so staying in a library waiting for something to print was not going to happen, even if I could find a library which had a 3D printer, a rare beast in the St. Louis metro area. So I uploaded my model to the MakeXYZ.com website and after several iterations it worked. But the model was big and expensive to print. Each iteration cost about $40 and two weeks of elapsed time from submission to delivery. Should I really consider buying my own printer? What is it going to cost? You can spend anywhere from $140 to several thousands of dollars on the printer itself. I was willing to spend $300 for my first printer, and for that I bought a machine that could print objects 220mm by 220mm in the X and Y dimension and 250mm in height. It has a heated bed, aka a build platform which makes it easier to separate the printed object from the platform. It has one extrusion system, which means it can print in only one color at a time. It can print using PLA, polylactic acid filament, a plant-based and environmentally friendly product which is readily available in about three dozen colors. PLA is generally available for about $25 per kilogram roll and a truck or other HO feature might weigh 25 grams, making the object cost less than a dollar in filament. Rolls smaller than a kilogram are also available. But if you want to print in colors other than white and you don't like to paint them, you will be buying multiple rolls of filament. Yes, you can sometimes buy filament in multi-packs with multiple colors, but sometimes the quality is not as good, with the loops of filament on the rolls sticking to each other and not feeding properly into the extruder. So do the math. Good filament in multiple colors can run several hundreds of dollars. Designing your own models is not for sissies, but you don't necessarily have to design them yourself. You can visit a library, search for an object of interest, and download as many as you like for printing anywhere you like. Library objects are like the women I dated in high school and college. There are millions of them. And instead of checking them out, you can download them and they are yours forever, with many of them being free. I visited thingiverse.com and did a search using the keyword dumpster. and dozens of images popped to my screen, most of them free. When I clicked on them, a download button appeared. 
and when I clicked on the button, Thingiverse would send them to the download folder on my PC, generally in the form of a zip folder. Inside the zip folder was a files folder containing a single STL file I could scale or print. Sometimes the zip file would contain multiple files for individual components of the entire project. I like to keep a clean download folder, so I would take the STL files and aggregate them into a topical folder on my hard drive, probably naming the folder something like dumpster. But like potato chips, it's hard to stop at one, so I often ended up downloading several different images, deciding later which one I wanted to actually print. But once an object is retrieved, there is no guarantee that it is sized to meet your needs. So that is where some design software, like Tinkercad, comes into play. So visit the site, click on the button to create a new design, and then on the Import button to import a STL or OBJ file. Tinkercad will give you the opportunity to scale it to a desired size. Even after the object is imported, it can be further resized. Once satisfied with the size, the resultant resized image must be exported to another STL file in your downloads folder for eventual printing. While Tinkercad is great for resizing these library images, it won't let you edit them. Thingiverse is by no means the only 3D library. There is also 3dwarehouse.sketchup.com which has millions of objects of its own, some of them free. Like Tinkercad, SketchUp is another piece of design software, and the 2017 version is free. 3D warehouse images are often stored in SketchUp's proprietary file format, which means they can be modified and eventually can be exported into STL files for printing but I have been less than totally successful with printing objects from the 3D Warehouse Library for reasons I have yet to understand. Tinkercad has its own library of designs. The Gallery tab on the Tinkercad dashboard allows you to enter keywords and retrieve objects from its library. Indeed, some of the objects you see in this tutorial are available by selecting the People option and then searching for David Ackman. The libraries keep on a coming. TurboSquid is another one I like, although many of their objects come with a fee. Libraries and service bureaus sound like a fantastic idea, but appearances can be deceiving. When downsized to HO scale, Many of the objects can lose integrity. When I tried to print some dumpsters, the walls became too thin to use. When I tried to print motorcycles, the wheel spokes and handlebars melted into mush. And the turnaround time it took for a model to be fabricated and delivered to my door was more than I could tolerate. So, just like some of the girls that I dated, the overall experience turned out to be something other than I thought it might be. But the experience was pleasant enough that I decided to buy a 3D printer. I was ready for commitment. Ah, commitment. But where to begin? Amazon, of course. 
A search for 3D printers uncovered 209 of them, from $139.99 to over $15,000. I had already decided I was willing to spend up to $300, but wanted a rating of at least four stars. I saw that there were close to 70 options under $300. I had a starting point. I fell in love with the unit from Monoprice, their cadet model. Its videos on YouTube suggested that it was simple enough for children, and their reviewers seemed to like it well enough. It advertised a self-leveling bed, which seemed attractive for a newbie like me. Its build plate was limited to 100 millimeters on a side, kind of small, but as a first-timer I was willing to overlook that limitation. I ordered one, and it arrived in two days, dead on arrival. Several hours in chat with their technical support, and the determination was that I should send it back to Amazon for replacement. The replacement arrived in two days, and it worked, for a week, then again failed. No amount of thoughts, prayers, or online chats could bring it back to life. So it was again returned, this time for a refund. That leads us to the most important factor in buying a 3D printer. Make sure you have 30 days to return it for a full refund. I was sure glad Amazon had a 30-day satisfaction guarantee, because I learned not all commitments are going to last. Sadder but wiser, I returned to Amazon, and this time noticed that many of the printers in my price range looked similar but were just offered from different resellers. I learned that the underlying model was an Ender 3 from Creality. It was offered as a base Ender 3 model and also an upgraded Ender 3 Pro. The YouTube videos seemed supportive, so I ordered and received an Ender 3 Pro for $250. But before unpacking, I received an email from Micro Center offering the same model for $200. So back my unit went to Amazon and off I went to Micro Center and bought the unit I am using now. Turns out that Creality was about to release version 2 of the Ender 3 with even more features than my Pro version but for about $60 more. Most of the V2 features can be purchased for the Pro as aftermarket items, and I was unwilling to wait. I bought an Ender 3 Pro. If I had to do it over again, I would buy the V2, again from Micro Center. But the time between when I purchased the unit and the V2 was available on the street, I got about four weeks of good experience and am satisfied with my purchase. Now it's time for learning to love. Now that you have decided which printer you think you want, but before you shell out your hard-earned cash, spend a couple of hours on YouTube and view some videos on how to unbox and set it up. You will save time and maybe some frustration. Just enter the name of the model you are considering and words like unbox or set up. Other words like problems and troubleshooting can be illuminating as well. No one is perfect and neither are any 3D printers. It takes time to learn the little things that make a relationship successful and happy. And I call this phase learning to love. For starters, my 3D printer came with some assembly required. The instructions were a series of illustrated steps without any narrative think IKEA. But the requisite tools were included and assembly took less than an hour. In retrospect, I was glad it was not plug and play because I learned a bit about the internals. The unit could be connected directly to a PC as a USB printer, but I chose the option to drive the printer from the SD card that came with the printer. The SD card even came with some demonstration files on it. I leveled the print bed and inserted the SD card. I loaded some PLA filament into the extruder and turned the machine on. The display sprang to life. 
The actions are controlled by turning a knob and pushing the knob when the desired action is highlighted. I selected a model to print and things started happening. I was printing an object. Success! I admit it. I had grandchildren with me that weekend and I spent the next two days downloading and printing Pokemon characters and bathtub boats for their amusement. But it got me going and I suggest you start by doing the same thing. A word to the wise. You will go through more than one extruder nozzle, so buy some spares. I bought a box of two dozen from Amazon for my Ender 3 Pro, and I'm glad I did. I also bought extra brass extruder wheels. These parts are considered expendables. While you are at it, buy a kilogram roll of white 1.75 millimeter PLA filament. Not much of this comes with the printer. I like filament from everyone from Amazon. Tool wise, if you need to change a nozzle, a 1 quarter inch ratchet wrench with a 6 millimeter socket will come in handy. But I had been warned. The YouTube videos told me that not only would I have things to learn myself, I would soon find things about my new love which were not particularly lovely. A YouTuber named Just Vlad had warned me that I would soon find shortcomings in her physical being, which, left unaddressed, would soon become difficult to ignore. After the first week of heavy usage, her shortcomings needed to be addressed. And fortunately, there were two kits from Amazon, which together, for about $35, helped straighten her out. The four springs that controlled the leveling of the bed were too weak, and several times a leveling handle just fell off, rendering the bed off-level. It was a simple task to remove the wheels and replace the springs with stronger ones in the kit. The kit also included a new 330 millimeter Bowden tube from Capricorn, which was an improvement. The metal Mark 8 alignment mechanism was a nice upgrade from the original plastic one, and the Z-axis upper bearing provided extra support for its drive rod. There was a shim in the Thingiverse library, Thing 2752080, which I was able to print to better align the Z-axis stepper motor. I strongly encourage everyone to watch Ender 3 YouTube videos from Just Vlad to see him install these and other upgrades. He is a wizard. The machine was a lot easier to get along with after I gave her more support. But enough about where my 3D printer had to change. I needed to learn a thing or two myself. If you are using your own printer, you will need to learn about a step called slicing. Slicing is a software step which takes the STL file created by a CAD program and transforms its contents into a G-code file containing instructions to tell the printer where to move the axes and how much filament to extrude. A version of the Cura slicing program came with my printer but it was at least three major releases behind the version that was available for free on the web. So I quickly downloaded the current release and set aside the one from the printer vendor, although I do return to it occasionally when the newer version has trouble with the model. The slicer program does require you to tell it what printer you are using. After that, it is little more than opening an STL file clicking on the slice button and saving the G-code file to your SD card or hard disk for eventual printing. There are options the most common being selection of the quality you want, setting the temperature specifications of your filament, and what type of build plate adhesion you want. 
if the object has legs, such as found on a dumpster or table, you may want a raft to make sure the object does not separate from the bed. But if the surface of the object is flat, like the back of a wall, then no special adhesion may be required. There are about six other settings in the slicer that might be useful to me once I learn how to use them. Leveling the bed must be done during the assembly process and regularly thereafter. The replacement springs helped hold the bed in place, but I still level the bed after about every 10 hours or so of printing. It takes less than two minutes to do so and is well worth the effort. If prints don't want to adhere to the bed, leveling is one of the several things I check. Another is scrubbing down the bed with isopropyl alcohol, 91%, after each large print. And I do mean scrub, not wipe down. Oils on the magnetic cover will get you every time, and the result will be a spaghetti monster. I generally watch the extruder deposit the first layer before walking away. If the first layer is solid, you have about a 90% chance that everything above it will be stable. Inserting filament into the extruder motor mechanism is easier once you learn to cut the end square and straighten about two inches of filament before trying to load it. Since the filament comes on a roll, it has a certain curve to it, and if not straightened, makes it almost impossible to get it into the Bowden tube. Sometimes it helps to rotate the filament a bit. If it takes me more than three tries to get it threaded into the Bowden tube, either I didn't straighten the filament enough, or I am pressing too hard on the mechanism lever. You will learn with experience. And not all filaments are created equal. In the beginning, I wanted as many colors as I could afford, so I bought a multi-pack from Gizmo Dorks and was not as pleased as I had hoped, mainly because the filament tend to get stuck on the spool and break, which of course ruined the print. I have been happy with the smooth running filament from everyone and it tends to be my filament of choice. I bought a three pack of metallic filaments, gold, silver and copper, sold by a company with the strange name of HZST3D and was pleased with the result. Mica 3D makes some good filament, but it is just a little bit sticky so I have taken to unrolling several meters of filament from the roll at the beginning of the job, re-rolling it back before printing actually starts, and then repeating this exercise several times during the job, especially if it is a large job. All of the above are sold through Amazon. Finally, I like the deep colors from Coax, made in the USA, but you will have to search for them on the web as Amazon does not carry their brand. I have been successful spray painting my 3D prints and painting with brush on acrylics. I have had no trouble with gluing 3D parts to each other or to styrene with either CA or bonding. I learned the hard way that PLA filament rolls should be stored in airtight containers along with desiccant packets, otherwise they will absorb water and require drying before they can be used. Before long, it was time to start raising a family of HO parts for my railroad. Again, I went to the libraries and downloaded and printed some detail parts, including cats and dogs, awnings, trash cans, tires, dumpsters, cars, trucks, motorcycles, boats, and small buildings, with varying success. Success seems to be related to how much I needed to alter the scale. If an object needs to be reduced by more than 50%, I am asking for trouble. The components that are small to begin with, like cable wires, wheel spokes, and window frames, are often too fragile to survive. My best luck seemed to be from Thingiverse when I included HO scale in the search criteria. Things like dumpsters, which I expected would scale well down to even 10%, often look fragile when printed. But there are so many good models out there that you will probably want to push the envelope anyway. Just be advised. 
I did want to share a few models I downloaded and printed from Thingiverse, which turned out well. There was a series of houses from K.A. Brumble, which turned out quite well. Among the first I printed were the Ionia, the Dayton, and the H.O. Scale Tenant's House, and I liked the results. He has about a dozen more high-quality houses and buildings on Thingiverse. I also liked the Miner's Cottage from Badger Breath. For accessories, I liked H.O. Scale Travel Trailers, H.O. Scale Office Trailer, H.O. Scale Picnic Table, Gazebo, and Containers H.O. Scalable V4, and many more. I was disappointed that I found so few H.O. vehicles. I print most of these in white to minimize filament changes, and gluing pieces painted with spray paint has not been a problem. It's no secret that I was successful in 3D printing some of my own designs, so may I share a few? My first original creation was a building interior I used in my amazing Arduino animations clinic. This interior is designed to separate rooms and floors, allowing each room to be lit independently. The trickiest part of any printing is to make sure the object sticks to the build plate, and for best results, I designed the object such that the largest flat surface lays directly on the build plate. In this case, the back wall of the interior is on the plate, with the walls, floors, and ceiling growing up from it. I learned that, at least in Tinkercad, it is not enough for walls and floors to meet. They must actually intersect. Consider a building where there is 35 millimeters between the top of one floor and the bottom of the next floor. For our purposes, assume that the floors are 2 millimeters thick. How tall should the walls be? 35 millimeters? Such touching joints did not work for me, but 39 millimeter walls, walls that actually penetrated the floors above and below, did. This is actually easier to do than it sounds, because Tinkercad has an align function that makes it easy. Once in place, I group all the walls and floors to make a single unit, then print. I use 5 volt LEDs on a roll to light my rooms, and control them with an Arduino microprocessor. I decorated the walls with images I downloaded from the internet and attached with rubber cement. Hot tubs were not really a thing back in my transition era layout, but I always wanted one in real life, so I decided to design one. It's really nothing more than a bunch of cylindrical solids and holes. My wife insisted, for safety's sake, the tub should have steps and a handrail. Brown paint decorated the outside of the tub, white the inside, add unpainted seated figures covered with swimsuits and COVID-19 masks, and voila! We had a socially distant soaking experience. I used clear silicone caulk and a drop of clear blue paint for the water, swirling a toothpick to simulate waves and bubbles. About 15 minutes ago, we discussed how Slicer software transforms 3D objects into instructions for a 3D printer in a format called G-Code. I am a curious kind of guy, and I wondered what G-Code looked like. Did you know that Microsoft Word will let you look into the contents of files other than a document? It's true. So let's start Microsoft Word. Do a file open. Navigate to a directory of interest. Tell Word we want to open files that end in .gcode. And there some are. And we can read them. Now. What can we learn from what we see? The first thing I learned is that anything after a semicolon is a comment, so the printer will ignore the rest of that line. Marlin is firmware running inside my Ender 3, and the first line confirms that the G-code should be operable by any printer running Marlin. Line 2 is another comment, which gives an approximation of how long, in seconds, it will take to print the file. This number is pretty accurate, 
so just divide the number by 3600 to get the approximate print time in hours. A bit lower, we see the minimum and maximum values for the travel of the X, Y, and Z axes. Pay particular attention to the max Z entry, which for my hot tub is 19.4 millimeters, the maximum height of the handrail. Just for curiosity's sake, be aware that the G0 commands move the extruder to a new location but without extruding filament, and the G1 lines move and extrude at the same time. Lines that begin with an M are miscellaneous functions, and not all 3D printers understand the full set of M commands. An overview of the Marlin firmware is online at http colon slash slash www.marlinfw.org under the About Marlins tab. The complete G-code language definition can be found at http colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash g hyphen code. Next, I decided my layout room needed a herald of my layout, the Baden, Vote, and Dismet, the three elementary schools I attended as a child. But what was I going to use for typography? My official logo uses Windows Algerian typeface, and Tinkercad is limited to three pretty nondescript fonts. Time for trick number one, a little complicated but very effective. I used PowerPoint's text box tool and entered the name of my railroad, Baden, Vote, and Dismet, on three lines and indented. I changed the font to Algerian and increased the font size to 100 points, about enough to occupy the entire page. I clicked on File, then Save As, and down at the bottom, where it says Save As Type, I selected a PDF file type and clicked the Save button. Since that was the only thing in this particular presentation, the name of the railroad was all that was saved. But if you desire, you could use the Options button to save just the current selection or a specific page. But so what? Tinkercad doesn't know how to import a PDF file. True, but the anyconv.com website does know how to convert PDF files into STL files, which Tinkercad can import. So I opened anyconv.com, navigated to the PDF file which contained my Algerian text, told anyconv that I wanted it converted to STL format, and hit the Convert button. Once converted, I hit the Download button, and immediately my PDF file was converted into an STL object and placed in my Downloads folder, which can then be imported into Tinkercad. In Tinkercad, I imported the new STL incarnation of my railroad name. The text is tiny, so I upped the scale factor from 100 to 10,000 and started the import. Once the import was completed, I reduced the height of my text to 2 millimeters and lifted the text to 2 millimeters off the build plate. I rotated the text 45 degrees and moved it into my desired position.
My extruder can extrude only one color filament at a time, but I can't export just certain parts into printable objects for the slicer. So I first exported the purple field into one file, and next the gold rim and text into another. My plan was to print the purple file, and when it completes, I'll change the filament to gold and print the second one on top. Well, not quite. What I did not know, and quickly learned, is that if an object is floating in air, like the gold rim and lettering, the Cura slicer will drop it to the build plate before extruding, and when I tried to print the gold layer, the hot nozzle quickly plowed its way through the purple field, like a drunken farmer on a 300 horsepower John Deere. I quickly stopped the print. After totally clogging my printer's hot end, I learned how to clean it by visiting YouTube and searching for Bowden Tube Gap by Tom Tullis from the Tomb of 3D Printed Horrors. I ended up removing the extruder fan, scraping solidified filament from the hot end, removing the nozzle, reaming the hot end with the Bowden Tube, and putting it all back together. I was sure glad I bought extra 0.4 millimeter nozzles because the old one was pretty shot. Despite the strange name of his website, Tom Tullis has a lot of useful operational hints, so you might want to browse what he has. But I was determined to find a way to extrude one layer over another, and the following is trick number two. Remember when we were investigating the innards of a G-code file? We saw that the maximum height of my hot tub was 19.4 millimeter. I opened the G-code file containing the purple field and saw its max Z was 2.0 millimeters. Well, it turns out that there is an M206 function in the Marlin language, which can offset the height of all following extruder movements by some desired height. I opened the second file, the one containing the brim and lettering, and scrolled down about 28 lines until I saw a line like G92 E0 semicolon reset extruder. Note that there are two of these lines at the beginning of the file, and I decided to place my cursor following the second of these, the one after draw the second line. Following the word extruder, I hit the enter key from the keyboard to start a new line, then typed M206Z-1.98 and saved the file. Don't forget the dash character between the Z and the offset amount of 1.98 millimeters. When saving the file, Microsoft Word will challenge us that we might really want to change the file type into a standard Word document, but we want to keep it in clear text, so we click on the Yes button, indicating we really know what we are doing. Remember, this G-code was created by the Cura 4.6.2 slicer, and different slicers will create different G-code. If you choose to use a different slicer, or even a different CAD package, it is up to you to adapt the technique to your needs, but I am confident that the technique should work in many different environments. Why an offset of 1.98 millimeters? I like to use an offset of 0 0.02 millimeters from the maximum height of the underlying field. Thus, 2 millimeters minus 0.02 millimeters is 1.98 and I use that as my offset for this layering trick. That is enough to let the heat of the extruder bond the upper gold layer with the underlying purple layer, yet not too much to cause the extruder to destroy the lower layer. By the way, 0.02 millimeters is also 20 microns less than half the thickness of the most slender human hair. Next, I used a similar overlay technique to create a billboard for radio station KDMR, which delivers news, 
farm reports, and sports to the surrounding area. Yes, I could have printed the call letters in station format separately and then glued them to its backer board, but once I learned the overlay technique I kind of like using it. The billboard design and support legs are available on Tinkercad under my name. Once I got the hang of it, I made some additional heralds for friends. I am getting pretty good at consistent success with my Ender 3 Pro. Keeping my magnetic bed scrubbed down with 91% isopropyl alcohol made a big difference in object adhesion. I still level the bed regularly, but I am down to every other day. I don't crash the nozzle into the underlying object anymore when doing layered prints. I store my filament in plastic bags with desiccant. I am having a lot of fun. Next month, my wife and I will celebrate 48 years of marriage and consider myself to be approaching mastery. I still have less than six months of 3D printing under my belt and in no way do I yet consider myself as having mastered the art of 3D printing. There is still so much to learn. I am convinced there is potential here for quite a lot of future projects in model railroading, both my own and from many other modelers. If you would like to have a handout containing the major points of this clinic, please visit my website at http colon slash slash daacm dot github dot io or email me at ackmans at charter dot net. I expect that in 30 years, 3D printers will be as ubiquitous in the home as personal computers are today. Right now, the path is not easy. The road is expensive, but the journey is its own reward. Thanks for joining me along the road. Okay, that was a, a great video there, Dave. Um, I'll hand it over to Neil for any questions. Agreed, Dave, and thank you for sharing all that. Um, um, there were a number of questions, and first off was, uh, why did you choose PLA or FDM over resin? Well, PLA was something that my printer could handle. And uh, I started with that and I haven't taken it any further. The Ender 3 Pro can do ABS, but I haven't given it a try or patchy or anything like that. I see. Is, is it, you know if there's advantages over one type of material over another? Well, there, there certainly is. Uh, PLA can be a little brittle. Uh, but it's inexpensive, and it's it's something that's worked for me so far. That sounds great. Um, we were talking a little bit offline about the possibility of rescaling models, and so you mentioned some things that I think is important that you share about going bigger to smaller and vice versa. Yeah, if I have a, a larger model and I try to scale it down uh, to HO, uh, it, it may not work for me very well. Some of the things which were maybe a, a half millimeter uh, wide to begin with when scaled down, maybe down it to 0.2 millimeter. However, uh, I made an interesting discovery today. I had a, a car interior. Here's a dining car uh, that I thought was in HO but was in N. But if you start with something that's smaller and then blow it up, it'll probably work uh, fairly well. So downscales can be problematic, upscales may be opportunities. All right, well, that, that, that answers that. And we talked a little bit about head sizes in your video, it talks about a 0 0.04 nozzle head. So have these gotten better? I mean, you can use smaller ones for different scales like N scale. You know, maybe in six months, I may give it a try, but still as a newbie, the only nozzle size I've used was a 0 0.4, which is the one that came with it. And I've bought more of them as well. Uh, so I'm going to stick with that nozzle size uh, for right now. Gotcha. There was a question about someone named Andy Ambrose who might be printing things for people in the Texas division. Are you familiar with Andy? 
I am not yet. Well, he's been on the line chatting, and so perhaps you guys need to co connect. So it sounds like he has a lot of experience. Uh, next question. Give me an email. You, yeah, there you go. Well, yours was up on the screen a moment ago. Um, have you tried printing multiple models on the same build plate? Yes, I have. Uh, sometimes if I'm doing a structure, I might do the front, back, and side walls all at a time. But the, uh, the amount of time that it takes to do multiple objects versus the sum of the time to do them as individual is larger. Because think about it, oh. the, the axes have to move from one part to another. So you spend more time in movements. However, if I'm getting ready to go to bed and let the thing run for 10 hours, I might put multiple objects on the model and print them all uh, at the same time. Uh, you mentioned to me that you model in HO scale, but obviously you printed some things in M scale if you by mistake. Do you, do you model primarily in HO scale? I model it almost exclusively. I do have a small two foot by four foot N scale layout where if I'm going to a, a clinic, a live clinic, and want to demonstrate something with a running model, I'll demonstrate it in N, uh, but mostly HO. Oh, that sounds terrific. I'm sorry, Andy clarified. He meant uh, someone named uh, Mike McKay. So. Oh, Mike another... McKay, yes. Uh, Mike is a pretty good uh, 3D printer who was part of the clinic back in July. Uh, he was putting together an army train, I think, with 100 uh, tanks on 50 cars. Uh, he's using a much more expensive, much more capable uh, printer than, than I am. So uh, he's, uh, he's farther down the, the path than I am. <laughs> Sounds like a good resource regardless. Um, he was kind did... enough to give me some advice. Okay. You you had your email address on the screen. Would you mind sharing it one more time for the people listening in instead of reading these? Sure. A-C-K-M-A-N-N-S, like more than one Ackman, at charter.net. And uh, I hope people got my website as well, which is D-A-A-C-K-M dot github g-i-t-h-u-b dot i-o and if folks would go there there'll be a handout there uh there'll be a link to repeat this video uh a little trailer if you just want to see 90 seconds of what i covered and also a survey folks if you go to my website if you would do me the honor of uh, taking maybe three minutes and letting me know uh what this uh, clinic meant to you and where it, may, it might be uh, improved. Uh, or just give me some information of what you might like to see in the future. I'd sure appreciate it if you take this survey. That sounds great. Um, you, um, your, your email address is Ackman with two N's and then the S like plural, uh, but your website is DAC. So uh, I think that's going to be easy to remember, but thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, it was, it was for David Allen Ackman, and that was my uh, login to my corporate website uh, for 40 years. So daackman.github.io. Well, if there's no other uh, questions, uh, aside from where did the name Tinkercad come from, um, I don't think you know the answer to that, do you, Dave? I don't have the answer to that, but Tinkercad is free. And it's where I just tinkered around to learn how to use CAD uh, at the very beginning. I only had five hours invested in the learning curve before I made that uh, interior uh, of the building. So uh, what? It, it is approachable, although other more advanced modelers tend to use uh, SketchUp or Fusion 360. But from where I am right now and where other beginners might be, it worked for me. Well, thank you so much. Um, you have a little advantage being a mechanical engineer, but I think if you can do it in five hours, I might be able to do it in 10. <laughs> I, I think many people can if they're willing to stick with it. Remember, it ain't simple. It is frustrating. But if you're willing to invest, uh, it can be quite fun. But if you're not willing to learn things, don't do it.
Well, on that note, I'm going to turn it back to Dave and so or Brad. Thank you.